So Tom, so you're Tom here, um, the winner of the UK alone. This is my very fun yeah. podcast. <laughs> um, so Tom, I just wanted to just uh, so start off um with the show alone itself. I've um I was watching it and I was totally inspired by your journey. Um, but I just want to start off um I suppose to give people I suppose the background on the show um you arrived to Canada um with very little supplies if I'm not mistaken um yeah should I give an overview of the show yeah please do yeah that'd be great yeah for sure thanks for having me on your podcast Claire um so yeah basically I was on a tv show called Alone um the concept is you get given 10 well you choose 10 survival items from like a list of 50 items and you're dropped into the middle of the Canadian wilderness uh, on your own. It's called Alone. And uh, it's just you and a camera, or you have four cameras. And you basically have to survive as long as possible, sustaining yourself. No film crew, no help, no rations. So you have to find your own water, food, build up shelter, uh, get fire with your 10 items. So like hats or cooking pots, sleeping bag, etc. And the idea is whoever lasts the longest wins the competition and yeah, you win a hundred grand and there's um, 10 of us doing this and you have no idea how many people are out there. Um, and yeah, you can, I guess some people quit because they hurt themselves. Like one guy accidentally put an ax into his leg. Um, you can be medically pulled if they, we, we have a medical every seven days and they can deem you unfit to carry on. Or, or most people effectively tap out mentally, like they, they, they reach their limit. I think when you're particularly hungry and particularly tired, you know, we become much more mentally vulnerable and, uh, and yeah, a lot of people hit their, hit their wall and give up at that point. Yeah. And there's bears and wolves and things like that, that I, I saw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they certainly kind of really add, try and add a bit of drama. They're obviously, you are completely in pristine wilderness. There are bears, there are wolves, there's moose, uh, there's lynx. Um, so yeah, I saw bear prints um, and a couple of bears on the other side of the river, but I wasn't that inundated, unlike some of the other uh, contestants who had quite bearing encounters. But we got pepper spray and an air horn just in case they got too close to us. Very nice. And you felt you um, built a very strong shelter as well. Um, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I was really happy with my shelter. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's something lovely about when your job is to last as long as possible in the wilderness. It's not a case of in modern society, we're like, right, I've got a job to do, I'm going to get it done as fast as possible. Out there, you're like, I don't want to finish this job. Otherwise, what am I going to do? So after I put like the basic structure and shelter together, I was like, now I need to craft a chimney and a fireplace. Now I'm going to put in some stone flooring. Um, now I'm going to like improve my bed and collect more moss. And I must have put like three foot, about a meter of moss that I pressed down to around a foot or so. Uh, and have more plans, more plans until it abruptly ended. I was going to put insulation in the loft and all sorts insulation <laughs> wow <Yeah. laughs> it was really uh, impressive interior design um did you um did you have a lot of the information before you um you know you took that on or did you feel like you were learning it as you were going I know you're really outdoors so, as it is yeah I I run a company called Desert Island Survival so I take people to uninhabited tropical desert islands and teach uh survival skills and fast away experiences I've never spent one day uh, surviving in a Canadian wilderness. So I had to transfer my machete skills to using an axe and my tropical knowledge to temperate woodland. So it was, obviously they are transferable skills and it turns out they were, but it was a completely new discipline and environment for me to, to have to learn. Like it was a crash course of learning the edible flora and fauna and um, and yeah, what different uh, plants and such I could utilize for cordage and all this, all this kind of nerdy bushcraft stuff. But um, but yeah, you know, you learn on the job. It's it it's it's a very pure test alone. It's um in the bushcraft community, it's called the Survival Olympics. You know, there's a few other shows out there that are quite contrived, quite scripted. But uh, alone, genuinely, you know, there was no um, no film crew with me. It really is as as you kind of see it. Um, and and so it is a genuine test of your skills. And it's many people think of it about a seventy percent mental challenge or thirty percent physical challenge because of course you've got to apply these skills but really it's it it is a mental test of more than anything spending that kind of time alone and as I said the, the less you eat the less you sleep the more that we will mentally unravel in those environments wow and like I know you've been a fan of the show for 
quite a, a long time as well. What was um the decider for applying uh, applying for it this time, or what was your goal um when you were going for it? Yeah, it had always been a dream to to go on the show. I've watched it for the last ten years or so. And in fact, they they emailed me. It was the first season. They emailed Desert Island Survival asking if we knew anyone who'd been on our trips that might be interested in doing this. Oh. And I was like, screw those guys. I want to do it. This is for me. <laughs> okay. And um, and and so so yeah. So I applied. I was one of two thousand applicants. And um, and yeah, luckily I got chosen. Wow. Um, I found out seven weeks before uh, that I was going on to the going in, and and then I started getting aggressively fat. I had seven weeks put on as much weight as possible and I put on uh 20 kilos which is 3.1 stone seven weeks wow and uh, I suppose you've lost all that now after being on the show have you yeah yeah I lost 18 kilos and 35 days out in the wild I was still heavier than when I went in so I still had a bit bit more timber to to spare as well when it finished wow my gosh um so since you've um I suppose you've done it was 34 days altogether, wasn't it? That you were in there. It was, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. I know it was a bit of a big adjustment as well when you when you finished. Um what was like one of the um the biggest I hope what was I suppose what was the biggest eye-opening piece in it? What was um what did you not expect like after that experience or I I didn't realize just how good I would feel out there. Once you've got everything taken care of, you know, once you've got sheltered water, fire, food, and you can just be in nature and live this pure existence, I felt my happiness levels elevate beyond what I'd ever experienced before. I don't meditate, and I now know how much I should practice meditation. Um, I naturally meditated out there because the first few weeks your brain is like this petulant brat. It's like, come on, entertain me. What have you got? And it's this, you know, it's this come down for the brain. And then after it's kind of like gone through all the conversations from when you're 12 years old that you completely forgotten about and like done this defragging of the recesses of your brain, it calms down. And you just, you know, you're, I'd spend hours every day just watching nature, watching the geese fly over, obviously just quietly fishing. Um, and it felt amazing. And the same for my physiology. Um, when my, my diet obviously out there just consisted of boiling fish and leaves and berries. And it was just so cleansing for me. I used to get problems with like IBS and bloating and that went away and it hasn't come back 12 months later. Um, and my whole body was less inflamed. And so it got me thinking that really we, you know, we are paleolithic animals. We haven't evolved one iota since the dawn of agriculture and everything that you see around us that we now think is just normal life for humans. This is not normal life for humans. 99.9% <laughs> yeah. .9 of our existence, we were hunter gatherers and we lived in close proximity with nature with very simple diets. And we, we just think, ah, oh, you know, our body will adjust to this. It's amazing how good the glove fits um, when, you know, when you go back to living that simple existence. And it's got me thinking how so much of the challenges and ills of modern society are this square paleolithic peg that we're trying to hammer in to the square hole of modern society that's yeah. like my big kind of takeaway for it and there's lots of distractions as well isn't there like you know it's hard to to get her to think straight really when we're in the midst of all that i mean yeah dopamine's another huge one you know we've only had the smartphone for 15 <laughs> years and now this little device is constantly like feeding us feeding us dopamine asking for our attention and all of this, you know, clever marketeers know how to tap into our paleolithic needs. Um, when I was out there fishing, it was amazing how you really become attuned for what this uh, mechanism is for. You know, every time I would, I would, if I got bored, I went fishing. I'd do it for three or four hours every day. And that, that was the kind of the secret of my success, really. I loved fishing. And every cast, you get a little kind of rush. It's like pulling um, a handle on a fruit machine almost. And then you get a maybe when you want to catch a fish like a bite and then when you land the fish it's like winning the jack and you just get this huge rush you know chemicals and you can feel it so purely when you remove all of the kind of i don't know distractions of modern life and distill it down to that simple existence these are what the mechanisms are for um and it feels so right yeah it's yeah. really kind of interesting to to witness and it's changed my perspective on life afterwards i you know i feel different and, how do you feel and, it's uh, changed your perspective things. Um, I think I'm 
I'm kinder to my body. I'm more aware and more in tune with my body. I listen to it more, a lot, a lot more. I, I think, um, I think I just more, I have a, a more, um, I guess more perceptive of things. I look at things through a very different lens. I, I kind of don't just accept modern society around me. I don't just sit down at a hotel buffet breakfast and just, you know, stuck in. I'm just for a few minutes in shock at the abundance of calories that we have in our modern society. Mm. I guess it just helps my lens and perspective mm. of, you know, of the animals we once were and where we've become, what we've become. And it just gives you, it just helps with a bit more, the more clarity and helping me to be a bit of a healthier mentally and physical um, person. It's interesting, actually, when you're you speak about food, it's something I thought about myself. Um, you know, when we say go down to the supermarkets, um, you know, every week or whatever, and, you know, you're picking up these packets of food and you really don't really know what's in them at all. And we have really lost a connection to like what we're eating. Um, 100%. And to the point that I think we don't, we're not even grateful of, of having the meals that are in front of us. So I feel it yeah. has a very negative effect on us. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Gratitude's another thing. So, yeah, mm. when people come on our desert island trips, they call it a gratitude reset. It's um, it, okay. it, you come back with a whole new appreciation for modern convenience, flat surfaces, you know, comfortable beds, the refrigeration, and, and that's like food that's so easy to forage for. Uh, and yeah, how calorie dense everything is. And you know, again, mm. that everything is made to appeal to that Paleolithic mind of you know fats and salts and things like this. When I um on the twentieth day, they didn't show it particularly, but I caught a duck accidentally in my net. And after I plucked and prepared this duck, I roasted it in my uh, Dutch oven pan, and I it was like a perfect roast duck. I like roast duck on a normal day. I appreciate I've got gratitude for that in my modern life. But on in the wilderness when I've only eaten fish and leaves for twenty five no twenty it was twenty five days. And I ate this duck. It was insane. I can't describe the pleasure, the smells. It was, it will forever be better than any triple Michelin star meal because hunger is the best sauce. You know, mm. like this, yeah, every flavor, the flavors were just exceptional. It's like, ah, oh, orgasmic. And, and just the fats and the salts. And, and I found myself as well enjoying parts of the fish that I wouldn't normally like, like, you could tell that the cheek meat had higher fat content and your brain starts to notice these things. I started to enjoy the liver, which I would normally hate. And your body recognizes the trace minerals and vitamins that are missing and rewards you for it. And um, yeah. Wow. So I feel like these clever strategies are used in obviously in like fast food and stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. Sure. And there's definitely something in it as well. I think when you actually are out there catching your own food. <laughs> um Yeah. <laughs> rather than picking it up from a shelf um yeah. you, you enjoy fishing That's, isn't it yeah I, I mean I don't fish day to day I fish when I'm on desert islands I used to fish as a kid in Portsmouth I never thought it would be in any way useful but I never even considered myself to be like a good fisherman um but uh, I tended up doing doing well on the show um, out there with it but uh yeah I, I'm not like a not like a proper fisherman That'd be the guy who put the axe in his leg after four hours. He's a really good fisherman. Um, so I, I reckon he would have pushed me further in, in the competition. It's a real shame that Mike um, bowed out when he did. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You had a fall yourself, actually, uh, towards the start, didn't you? Uh, was it you were carrying? Um... Yeah, when I was, uh, that was a bit of a scare. That was the closest I really came to um uh being, being any kind of real trouble i was carrying rocks to build my chimney i put them in my rucksack oh, and i'm yes. walking across uneven ground and i twinged my back um nothing too bad but it was enough to be just like right i need to lie down this could escalate this could be problematic and mm -hmm. uh i ended up collecting willow which contains the same active ingredients as aspirin again they didn't show um, and i used that as a painkiller um and felt much better um but uh yeah it was it was definitely like a bit touch and go for a day or two i had to be a bit ginger but it just shows like very very small mistakes can have severe consequences when the only route to food um is yourself if you're incapacitated if there's no tribe to support you and look after you you know that's it you're, yeah, yeah. you're, you're very vulnerable out there and that's why like every when it finished i had 20 fillets of fish stashed away that they didn't show but like that that 
buffer is also so good. It's like it's like the difference of someone who's very poor having to live hand to mouth, check by check. The you know the mental capacity that it takes for them, the anxiety mm -hmm. of like, am I going to run out of money? It's so palpable for people that are living on the breadline. And yeah. and so for me, like having my twenty billets of fish was that buffer. It was that that I guess gave me a lot more mental fortitude, knowing that I if I didn't catch a fish today. Yeah, yeah, and it just goes to show, I suppose, the importance of like the preparation is key part. I mean, um, having the fish aside there, but also like with you, you use willow, was it for aspirin? Um, you know, yeah, yeah. knowing that piece of information is like, um, you know, key really. Like, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't yeah. know that. <laughs> Um, yeah no of course and, yeah you, you, that's where you need you need that good 30 percent of, of solid bushcraft skills to help you in those in those environments and also like in preparation every day i would check in with myself and it's it's a very simple task of just like how do i how am i doing today on shelter how am i doing in water how am i doing on fire how am i doing on food how's my mind how's my body where do i need to top up today i just look at it as like i've got these six buckets and i've just got to make sure that all those buckets are full and as long as they all stay full i can last out long last as long as I can out here and like compartmentalizing and same with like our busy lives I think just taking stock and journaling like I'm thinking about you know how am I doing how am I doing in my job how am I doing in my health how am I doing in my relationship how am I doing in my friendships how am I doing you know I think I'm just making sure that you know we top up in those kind of areas of life and be, yeah and, really and everything's in balance as well um absolutely yeah, yeah. because you can hear people like who could just focus on that job, 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 nothing else. I think Warren Buffett was famous for this and he neglected his family. He has a lot of resent, not mm -hmm. resent, remorse for, for not being a good dad and things. And any of us can kind of do well in one, but it's in life, I mean, you know, but trying try to, yeah, achieve yeah. that kind of balance. Yeah, absolutely. And something I've noticed as well about, um, you know, your, your time there is you've such a strong connection to nature as well that um, I think you were able to find a lot of joy in a lot of the things you were doing. Um, and I think yeah. that was a really nice strength that you had while you were there. Um, like, do you think that made all the difference in? Um... I'm glad. I'm glad that came across because that again, I didn't feel like that gratitude was really shared. Um, I it, the most powerful thing at the beginning for me was a combination of nature and my internal kind of optimism. So when I arrived, I I saw my land for the first time. A lot of people get what's called drop stock, which is where you're basically like, this is nothing like I imagined. What the hell am I going to do? and people spiral very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I arrived at my land and I was like, this place is kind. I can just feel generosity and abundance <laughs> emanating from this wall of green. <laughs> and um, I was like, it's, we're going to get on just great. And so I think that, and then I realised later that is just my perception. Perception is reality, you know, yeah. and it's just my optimism reflected back at me. But, but in general, you know, I did just feel this wonderful connection with the land i felt i felt mother nature looking after me i felt nurtured um the river you know by the end of it all i was drinking was the river water all i was eating was the pipe i was in many ways the mackenzie river i was so connected to it and again it's something we're so lost you know i'm in a square box right now can't see the sky and we we're not connected to our circadian rhythm from the natural flow of light and all these things that are just this disconnect no wonder we have like such high levels of anxiety mm -hmm. and depression and yeah. all sorts. So get out there and touch some grass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, yes, it's, that, it's like that, you know, if you're really anxious, like some people say, you know, take off your shoes and go down, like, you know, mm. and by a tree, you know, and you'll get that grounding energy back, you know, it's those mm. things. But it's amazing how that can be new information to a lot of people. You know, we seem to have really disconnected from it. Yeah, and it's often kind of disregarded as just being kind of woo-woo nonsense. Mm. And, <laughs> and no, there's there's an awful lot of truth in it. And uh, yeah. yeah, you know, you only have to experiment, you know, this evening, you could turn off your devices one hour before you normally go to bed and just spend that time journaling or reading a book or just, I don't know, just lying there with your eyes closed thinking about you know, mm. a five-year plan, whatever it might be, and yeah. just feel like how different you feel for that one hour of digital detox and then like yeah. try that tomorrow then just just take a walk for one hour without your phone like it's so anxious we don't never leave the phone never leave the yeah. house without a phone you get anxiety but it's so you, you're so much more in the moment you look at what you're where you are and you connect and slow down and it's it's really good for us i think we don't allow time for our brains to get bored 
So mm. like we're never as creative. We're not um we're not as aware of our thoughts that are in our mind. Uh, you know, we're constantly overstimulated. But we're, we're never allowing downtime for our brain. Yeah. And it wears us out. It does. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like what you said, their creativity, you know, if we don't have that space, like, you know, we're not going to be able to access that part of our minds or our intuition. And it's the simple act of living as well, isn't it? You know, just it is. Yeah. Be, uh, yeah, it really is. Unwired from technology, you know. Um, yeah. Do you know, um, so um, your journey itself as well, your life's journey has been really interesting. I wanted to touch on that as well. Um, you know, you you've taken a lot of brave choices in your life. I've, I've seen on your website, you know, you you worked in a job years back that I think wasn't fulfilling you too well. And then you you decided yeah. to do that trek up north, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, for the North Pole. A big, massive um, step in a very different direction. Um and I know I've seen that you you sailed as well, 8,000 kilometers. Um, was that from Chile to Canada? From Canada to Chile. From yeah. Canada yeah. to Chile, sorry, the other way around. Um, yeah. and, and you're now a founder of um the the de- desert island um and survival, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so like you've taken massive um, you know, really courageous steps, you know, and um have been very successful in that, you know. Um like I, I find that really inspiring <laughs> and um oh, thank you to then go on to do a loan <laughs> yeah yeah and who knows what what else there may be um yeah. I I think you know particularly when we're younger it's important to take risks I think risk is something that's maybe uh discouraged in society mm-hmm. um but I firmly believe like you and you don't you know a lot of these things you don't have to take a big risk but many of us are very afraid to roll the dice at all we always think of oh I could never do that because x y and z and we always put barriers in in front of us of why we can't make these courageous steps like you making your courageous step mm. but obviously you you know you've done it and the worst that happens is we can always go back but no one seems to consider this option there is always other ways back you know it's not it's not completely the, the door is is closed um I think yeah I mean like so I I failed academically. I was bossing my school. I was the fattest kid in my school. I had no expectations on my shoulders, which is quite good. Um, so just getting to university was like really surprised my parents, I think. Um, and then I I managed to get a chance to go map coral reefs when I was nine, when I was 20 in Honduras, and that counted as a year of university. And that was a moment in life where I just kind of stepped right outside of my comfort zone and left the UK and suddenly it was like wow there is a whole incredible world out there even underwater I was just spending um a couple of hours a day underwater map coral and it just I just came back Pandora's box was open you know I had a new perspective on life and I after something like that I couldn't just settle for the typical job but I got a typical job I got a good salary um at sales fair my parents were happy as like I got this job selling software and then I was just miserable selling software. I was like, ah, oh, I, I think I even thought about crashing into the central reservation. I was like, I just, I can't, I, I, I couldn't do it. I didn't, couldn't be in that cubicle. So, so yeah, I ended up talking to a friend who said he'd walked to the North Pole. I was like, that's what I need. I need to walk to the North Pole. I don't want to be pigeonholed as a software salesman. So, so yeah, I trained for two years and raised money and walked to the North Pole when I was 27. And then I met my wife and we moved to Chile. And the only job I could do in Chile, not speaking Spanish, was working in finance. And, and <laughs> so I worked for this expat finance company for like five years and went back to the cubicle and I was miserable again. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, just, I, I did get on that super yacht and did the sail bit for a bit. Wow. Um, but and then, yeah, I just was one day dreaming about diving in remote areas where humans have had no impact on, on desert islands and, and I thought you know is there a company that takes you to desert islands and I looked it up and there wasn't really so I was like well I'll set that up and wow. I, I guess I can currently set it up whilst I was still working in the finance job and I don't think we need to be unnecessarily um, risk courageous and say right I'm leaving and now I'm going to set up my job you know, yeah. of course, if you have the opportunity to keep that safety net in place as long as possible, but um, but yeah, don't you know work your evening setting up this new company until until you're at a point where you think this might succeed and you can cut away the tethers of your existing job or whatever it might be. But um, 
yeah, yeah it's uh, I think a part of it is listening to your um your inner voice as well you know I think a lot of us know what the answers are um and yes it's moving yeah. in that direction in whatever way is right for you um, yeah 100% yeah. And I've always, I've always had this strong kind of belief, and I think it was accentuated when my, my mother died as well, the kind of mortality aspect of it, that life is not a dress rehearsal. You know, you really get one go. This is our one shot, and it's a miracle just to be alive in this universe, like the, the, the infinitesimally small odds just to exist. And we're fortunate enough to have that ticket. Yeah. And let's make the bloody most of it. You know, this is our yeah. one go. Yeah. Life's too short not and, to, you know. Um, and we always make excuses of like, oh, but I, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have the money. Again, these are kind of human. All of us are born with three billion seconds. Like, yeah. That is that is your money. That is money. Is really is time. You have yeah. Three billion seconds. How are you going to spend them? Yeah. And and you know, you think you need the money for all of the normal kind of modern conveniences that we think we need, but a lot of it can be streamlined away. You know, I've, I've met plenty of people who are literally have gone traveling with 500 quid and a bike and they've been got on the road for like six years doing this and they make it work um because they've taken that bit of courage that they can deal with that discomfort and i think building up your tolerance to discomfort and building up your resilience can also really help with you know, making more kind of more courageous decisions yeah. and choosing life a little bit more yeah 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 working on our backbone and you know just getting out there and yeah 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 because life's pretty comfortable and easy, you know. Yeah. We're like we're like house cats. Yeah. <laughs> house cats. We are really just for yeah. house cats. Yeah, yeah. We don't we don't realise it. Sometimes you have to push yourselves out of that. Um yeah, I was telling you earlier that I um I did the Camino and I think sometimes you have to create these opportunities to actually build your own resilience, you know, because we're not going to find it when, you know, if we're, you know you know spending our own downtown or you know just not having you know lying on the sofa watching netflix yeah. what, what are we ever going to achieve there we have to yeah. get out it's cheesy but the only place we grow is outside of our comfort zone it's we it. have to, and that's it and you have to grow that comfort zone bigger and bigger and bigger and that's then when cool. you're outside of it the next time it's so much easier to 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 adjust to and it's you know it's just like going to the gym yeah yeah you're, you're more resilient that's it yeah yeah so do you have any goals on, on what's next? Um, or is it just... Uh... I'm trying to <laughs> use this as a catalyst to get into keynote speaking. So I'm looking at oh. talking about um, yeah, my experience on alone and Desert Island Survival in the North Pole and, and doing some keynote speaking. So that's that's oh. kind of a new thing, avenue that I'm looking at exploring. Um, but as far as like big adventures, uh, I'm also considering setting up a, um, like Desert Island Survival, but Scandinavian ones, people that have watched the show and they kind of want to have the alone experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got some big kind of adventures that I, I want to, to do at some point. Like I'd like to kayak the um, Okavango Delta in Botswana, and I'd like to kayak down some of the tributaries of the Amazon River and do some, some long kayak adventures at some point. We'll see. Incredible. Wow. Wow. I'm very we'll excited to see what you do next. <laughs> you know, keep, keep <laughs> Who <it going>. knows? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. That's that's perfect. I know I'm probably going to over half an hour with you now, but... um. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So It's great there, speaking with you. Yeah, it's been great speaking with you too. Um. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um. And yeah, looking forward to hearing what's next for sure. Um. And cool. I'll be keen to those expeditions. I think myself. <laughs> yeah. And if anyone wants to get in contact, you can find me at tomwilliams.tv or uh, desertislandsurvival.com. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Tom. All right. Lovely chatting. chatting. Take care. It's been great. Thanks. Cheers.